Yeah, so hi, welcome to my talk. I'm Ludwig, working for SUSE uh, as engineer in the Future Technologies team. And today my topic is user merge and beyond, what's happening to the file system layout. So we're going to talk about how files are organized on a Linux system. And to start, I have a question. Where are config files in a Linux system? That's not the answer I wanted to hear. So, <laughs> but it's true, yeah. So it was Jan saying all over the place, but normally the answer is ETC, and only with that answer I can go to my next slide. <laughs> because then we can actually look at a file in ETC and see it says, please do not change ETC profile, as an example. So a configuration file, to my understanding, is that I can modify it but this file, there's supposed to be a config file in ETC, says I should not modify it because the operating system will override it on updates. And similarly, there are other examples, like for example that one, LDSO cache, that clearly says it's data. So that is by no definition a config file. So that's an ETC and not a config file. Okay, so back to school. Let's see what they what they tell you when you learn about Linux. So as we just discussed, ETC is supposed to be for config files, ideally. And then you have other kinds of files, data, that is in var, but also user local uh, or opt could be one of those locations because you put arbitrary things in there. Another kind of file type is, is boot files. Those end up in slash boot, like the kernel, init.d, bootloader configurations for grub, and also the operating system itself. That is also all over the place. For example, in bin, S bin lib and lib64, and the major part is in user. In the modern Linux systems, we also have a number of virtual memory file systems, so like kernel interfaces in proc and sys, the dev file system, or temp is nowadays also a memory file system. So how does that look like in a full file system tree? I use the same colors here. Like in ETC, it's supposed to be config files, but really it's mixed here with green color, so it means there's also operating system stuff in there. Similar for slash boot, um, we have the boot files that could be from the operating system, like the kernel itself, but the init.d or the bootloader config is generated, so it's not from the operating system. Then we have all the directories from the operating system, and finally some data locations that are also a mix. So even though we have locations that we are supposed to avoid, like SRV or opt, there are still packages that put stuff in there. So it's a mix between data and stuff from the operating system. The only exception, I think, that is actually adhered to in RPMs is to not put stuff in home. So that's why I put it only in, in violet here. So that is the only one with only data. And in a classic tree, you can right everywhere, of course. That's about how a Linux system looked like before ButterFS came. And then came ButterFS, at least on SUSE. We introduced snapshots and rollback. So then suddenly you had the need to um, be able to revert to a previous state of operating system files in case of something going wrong. But you can't do that with data. Like you can't just roll back your PostgreSQL database just because you figure out some update went wrong with some unrelated tool in the distribution. So the way SUSE solved that was to create separate ButterFS subvolumes for those data volumes and just don't snapshot and roll back them. So that's why I painted them in, in violet here, only data, but in reality there are still RPMs that put stuff in those locations and they won't be part of a snapshot, so they won't be part of a rollback. So if you really roll back and have stuff installed by RPM into SRV, the result of a could be just random. So the RPM database is not in, in sync with what's actually on disk. So I would really like to simplify all of that. And the first step to that is the user merge. So we get rid of all those green locations and put them all in one. That is a step that other Linux distributions already did a decade ago. So we take 
all the operating system files that are considered read-only and put them in user. I know it's controversial with some old folks, but I mean, that's how it is. It's decided, so we did that in OpenSUSE also. The old locations won't go away, so you still have sbin, bin, lib and lib64, and there are some links to the counterpart in user. So with that step, we make the, the operating system already a bit more clean. But still, the idea is to get all of the operating system in, in user. So the next location that we could move the operating system files out would be slash boot. And in fact, we nowadays in AFI systems, we have two boot partitions, the AFI partition and the slash boot partition. So if we move stuff out of slash boot anyway, why not use the AFI partition as boot? So we put the kernel in user and the rest in the AFI partition directly. That would mean as a side effect, the kernel entity or whatever is in the boot partition is no longer part of a snapshot. Also for full disk encryption, those parts can't be encrypted anymore because it's a partition that the firmware needs to be able to read. So that's, that's a, a future step basically that we could do. To clean this up further, go back to the initial example. Let's also get rid of all the stuff that is in ETC from the operating system. So then we end up with a system that has all the operating system in user exclusively. It means RPMs can't install stuff in ETC anymore or in any of the other locations actually. That is the consequence that we can have revisions of the operating system independent of the config files that we have in ETC. To continue making the, the diagram simpler, we could also get rid of all those separate data volumes and say data is data, all of the data is in var. I actually, that came to my mind when looking at a Raspberry Pi, so I found all those ButterFS subvolumes on my SUSE installation, and I, I did some micro -S, so I actually thought, why would I need user local and SRV and opt? There's nothing I install in there. So just get rid of all of that, put all of that in var, and then we end up with a system that has like four volumes, the, the one for config, the one for boot, the one for the operating system, and the one for your data. Makes things much more simple. So the, the result of such a system would be that we have a clear separation of config data and the operating system. We can create volumes according to the usage, because for example, the operating system is read-only, whereas data is written frequently, so we could actually choose different file systems for that. As I said, snapshots would be independent of the operating system. Another consequence would be that we could maybe get rid of this overlay of S in micro, F, micro OS, because that's because there's operating system files in ETC and stuff that you edit yourself. So if, if we don't put operating sy system stuff in ETC anymore, then we don't need this overlay FS. Additionally, this kind of system helps with the use case that Thorsten presented before. So if we use a image-based installation and all of the operating system is in user, that makes it much more easy because all of that is contained in just this directory. And also a possibility with such a system would be entirely stateless because you could just rebuild the config from scratch. You just need the operating system and the boot partition basically and then all the rest can be created on first boot for example and removed again. So where are we? User merge is done since last year actually. So the file system package migrates your Tumbleweed installations live if you do a super dub and it succeeds, then user merge is done. Most people probably didn't even notice. For those thinking of creating updates from older stable releases, keep in mind, this feature relies on super using one transaction per RPM. So if you have the crazy, crazy idea to fix the way super works in all distributions and use one transaction for all of it, then user merge conversion won't work. <laughs> So in a user merge system, lib and bin and sbin and stuff that stays as a compat symlink stay forever. If you're a packager, you can use the if SUSE version uh, conditional if you need to have your package built for SLI and for factory. The next step now would be to tackle slash boot. So what's already done is 
the kernel is already moved to user, in case you didn't notice, but in slash boot there's only symlinks left if boot is uh, on the same volume as, as user. Otherwise, the postscript of the kernel actually copies it there. But we are not done with this yet. My goal would be to go for a kernel install from systemd. So instead of having some custom kernel magic in the postscript, the user drop in for this uh, kernel install script from systemd, and that one will do the kernel management for us in slash boot. Um, we need to integrate it with grub still, of course. But if we use this mechanism, then we have the chance to switch to systemd boot also, because that's natively from systemd. And also, I think we have the chance with this model that, for example, Raspberry Pi that has a special firmware that can boot kernels directly, we could also have drop-in scripts that handle this specific case specifically, instead of adding more layers of indirection that just slow down boot. A challenge with that one is that the boot volume won't be part of a snapshot anymore. So we somehow need to solve the rollback case outside of ButterFS. We need to know which kernel in the boot partition belongs to which user tree, because the user tree contains the modules. So I'm currently working on a prototype for that. I think it can be done just by some config files, but nevertheless, it's not there yet. Yeah, then to have the operating system in, in user exclusively, there's also some work to do. So no more ETC profile means all packages have to check their packages and move all the stuff they have in locations other than user into user. For config files, that means, for example, to use built-in defaults. That's the preferred way to do it. Alternatively, you could also use files in user etc and allow the admin to override them in etc. And if everything fails, use systemd temp files to just copy a, a file there. A consequence of doing that would be that scriptlets can't modify etc and var anymore. So the stuff that does stuff to var is already kind of broken today on micro s because the var you see in a transaction is not the one that you have on the system. So example of a postscript is user add. Um, the, the replacement would be systemd sysusers. So instead of creating the user in the postscript, you have a file that the systemd this user's tool can create probably on next boot. I think we still need to invent a mechanism to have some kind of config file migration, similar to uh, SQL databases migrating their data. We need something to migrate our data in ETC in case a new version of the operating system gets started on boot. And same to do the, the rollback. What also won't work anymore is update alternatives. I think the, the replacement for that is already partially in place in factory. So there's lib alt. So you, you can't have those symlinks to var anymore. And what will, would also break if we have a completely read only user would be the permissions package. So, I mean, you can't change the permissions in user anymore. So we need an alternative for that or just drop it. No seduity. It'd be really cool. So to summarize, if you build a system like that, we end up with a strict separation of config data and the operating system. We're using existing technology to build modern systems, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel, a new delivery, delivery mechanism, no new build mechanism. We use plain old RPMs just in a new way. So it may look like it's invasive, and it is to some degree, but it's a completely iterative approach. We can just update our packages one by one. And that's basically what I wanted to say today. So, questions? I see one. Do we have a microphone? Not so much a question, just to note, there is over a thousand of pack, uh, Python packages which use update alternatives and uh, use them right now, So, I, and I'm not exactly sure whether we can replace all of them with libalt. So just that it could be pretty big deal if 
it happens. Yeah, so wouldn't it be possible to change al uh, instead update alternatives so they don't use uh, etc alternatives but something else? Maybe. I mean, sounds like you will be busy for a while then. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I am not busy. <laughs> so I can answer this question about update alternatives and alts. So the base system is not using update alternatives already anymore, but only alts. So if you install a micro OS, no update alternatives is used anymore. If we can replace, if we can move etc alternatives somewhere else, Yes, we can. We can move that to user etc, for example. But then it's read only, and update alternatives doesn't work anymore at all. Well, but <laughs> because it's no longer configurable. Also in war alternatives either, yeah? hmm? No, war alternatives is only internal database. So alternatives is has etc alternatives, var lib alternatives, and the uh, links in user. And it's modifying too much. That's why we created the alternative alts and is, are using that as base for micro OS. Um, I can add even some more. We had an approach to uh, to change update alternatives to uh, just use etc, uh, but that basically slept in. I don't think it was ever published to to Tumbleweed. Um, there was an approach one could try to get it working again, uh, but yeah, for now, due to all that uh, directories var etc and user, which update alternatives is using, uh, that's currently not possible. Any other questions? Can't see much, so. I guess no. Then we're done. I still have my.